All right, so we're in Daniel chapter 9, and this is the answer to the prayer of a righteous man, and that would be part A, instead of part 1. I just thought I'd change it up a little bit. I want to get creative today. Daniel chapter 9, and we looked at this first part <clears throat> for a couple of weeks. We're going to pick it up in verse 20. So Daniel's praying, and verses 1 through 19... Uh, constitute his prayer. Verse 20, he says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be 70 weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolation. Well, without a doubt, this is probably one of the most problematic passages in the book of Daniel. I say problematic because uh, there are a lot of different ways that people have attempted to understand what's going on here and what he's talking about. And, and I also know that there are some who would object to me calling this problematic because they have their interpretation and it tends to be enshrined upon the level of inspiration because they're certain about what this means and any deviation from that uh, is heresy in their mind. Uh, I, I hold a little different perspective on some of this and I, I know people who I love and admire who hold a different perspective than mine. Um, I just look at things a little differently but you understand that we have an inspired and an inerrant scripture. We do not have an inspired and an inerrant interpretation. Only scripture is at that level. And even as far back as the 5th century, uh, St. Jerome in his commentary on the book of Daniel identified nine different interpretations of this passage. Probably in the 21st century, we could add a few more to that. Um, so, as we look into the passage, I want us not to ignore the context, which was the first 19 verses, actually. Recall, this is, in, this is occasioned by intense prayer offered by Daniel on behalf of the Jewish people in captivity. He's confessing his own sin, and he's confessing the sins of the people. And verses 20 to 27 is a response to that prayer. Uh, Daniel is not trying to understand distant future events. He's not really interested in prophecy or anything like that. Uh, this is the response that God gave him uh, to his prayer. Um, so by now, maybe you're accustomed to the way I tend to do things. I'm going to look at these remaining verses under three different sections. But then the third one will have three of its own. I like threes. I like, would like to make three figures. 
I do, but the decibel point's not in the right place. So notice that the request here was intense, and that's going to remind us of the context in verses 1 through 19. Uh, we noted before how Daniel places himself among his people. He confesses their sins, even if he's not the one that had a lot to do with it. But he's confessing the sins of his people. In verse 3, it tells us that he's fasting and he's wearing sackcloth, which is a tangible expression of mourning and grief. Now, think about this. This is not Daniel praying, forgive us if we have failed. It's not some nebulous prayer like that. Uh, in fact, if you look at verse 20, uh, the wording seems to indicate that this was not just a one-time event. I mean, if you're fasting, you just don't do that once. I mean, that, that's a long period of time. Uh, it, it, it seems as though Daniel understood, uh, as, as, as he understood Jeremiah, he's persevering in prayer and confession and mourning and fasting. I think maybe this prayer in verses 1 through 19 might summarize his praying over a long period of time. It's kind of like the content of what he had been praying for many days and weeks. Most of us do not know the intensity of this kind of praying. I mean, let's face it. A lot of our praying is trivial in comparison. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not mocking this because I've, I've done some of it, but I've heard people say, well, I've prayed that the Lord would give me a good parking spot at the Walmart. Or... Um, I prayed the Lord would help me to find my keys. And there they were. And being a person prone to lose things, I probably have done that too. But Daniel is praying for something much more serious than that. He's praying for the preservation of his people. He knew that they were in Babylon, surrounded by idols, false deities, they were listening to a language they didn't understand, and he knew the misery of that, as well expressed in Psalm 137, where it says, We sat down by the rivers of Babylon and we wept. And he knew that they were there because of their own sin. And he knew that the God who sent them there was not a God to be trifled with. This was serious praying. Now, you, you know the passage probably I have in mind. Maybe you're already thinking about that. But the Apostle James uh, refers to another prophet, a man by the name of Elijah, who prayed that God would avert the judgment that he was sending to his people. And he says, uh, he says uh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, the King, Jan King James says, availeth much, or is, has great power in his working. You see, we think of Daniel, we think of it as a book of prophecy. But maybe it's also a book of prayer. I mean, don't neglect what we read about that. We find Daniel way at the beginning praying when he's called upon to interpret the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. So he went to his three friends and they prayed. We find Daniel praying at the risk of his own life when uh, the decree went out that no one was to ask anything for, for so long except to Darius. And when he knew the decree was signed, he went to his house, opened the windows, and stood there and prayed like he usually does. So his request here was intense, but the response was immediate in verses 20 through 23. Gabriel is sent to Daniel, and he says, at the beginning of your pleas, the word went out. This is an example, I think, of the teaching of Christ, who taught his disciples how to pray. And so before he gives them that model that we call the Lord's Prayer, he makes this very important statement. He tells them not to pray with meaningless and empty phrases. 
heaping words on top of each other, thinking that maybe sometime, some, for some reason that God, God will answer prayer based upon the length of the prayer or upon a vocabulary. I kind of wish sometimes we would think about that when we pray. Sometimes I think we're praying more to the people who are listening than to the God that we say we're directing our prayers to. But instead, before he teaches them how to pray, he says, now listen, your, your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. And sometimes we pray that uh, in such a way that we're, we're you know, God, you, I, I know you don't know this, but here's the situation. And um, like we are informing him and giving him information that he doesn't have. Instead, we pray. Of course, I think it's helpful here to see once again that there's no contradiction. Uh, there's no conflict with the sovereign purposes of God and the believer's responsibility and duty to pray. We are to pray. Prayer is one of those ways that God works out his sovereign purposes and his design for our, li for our lives. I think, in a sense, we could say like this, that every prayer is answered immediately. Now, it may not be the answer we're praying for, but it doesn't mean it's not answered. Um, if the answer doesn't come in the time that we expect it to come, doesn't mean it's not answered. If our prayer is like Jesus taught us to pray, uh, primarily, your kingdom come and your will be done, then we can be assured that our prayer is answered. And it's answered in God's way and in God's good time. I mean, Jesus prayed in the garden to his Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Was his prayer answered? Of course it was. It was answered because he was more concerned about the priority of the will of God than his own will. So if one of our friends was diagnosed with, with terminal cancer, and we pray fervently for that friend's healing, and say the friend is not healed, does that mean the prayer is not answered? No. No it does mean that it's just not answered in the way we think it should have been. Daniel gives us great encouragement here to pray. Our prayers are heard. We don't need to manipulate God. We don't need to schmooze Him or to otherwise try to convince God to hear our prayers. Uh, Daniel says at the beginning, it says here that the angel said, at the beginning of your pleas, a word went out. Now remember, Daniel prayed and Daniel fasted, indicated that was an ongoing thing, but God was sending the answer at the very beginning. Persevering prayer in fasting is not convincing God. It is not manipulating God. It is exercising faith and trust in the one who says, pray without ceasing. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking and keep on seeking. The response was immediate, even though Daniel was not aware of that immediate response. And then the reply here was instructive in verses 24 to 27. I said at the beginning that this is a confusing passage for many Bible interpreters. However, Gabriel was sent to Daniel not to confuse him, because he's confused enough already with all his previous visions but to bring him clarity. Uh, this chapter is based upon Daniel's study of Scripture. If you look at the first part of it, it says he was reading the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, there's no mysterious and obscure dream here, no visions that must be interpreted. There's no animals, no multi-headed beasts or dragons, and no images and no kingdoms. This results from the writing of the prophet Jeremiah concerning the captivity of the Jewish people. And Daniel understood enough of the scripture to know that the captivity came from their own sinfulness and their failure to repent. And he also knew that the captivity was decreed for 70 years. And depending upon when that countdown actually began, whether it was the 
besieging of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple, he knew that the end was in sight. And so God sent Gabriel to give Daniel further insight and illumination in the scripture. Notice he says, I have, uh, I have come out to give you insight and understanding in verse 22. And he says in verse 23, therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So Gabriel was sent to make some things clear, not to confuse any further. Now think about this. We, we believe that the words before us are the inspired words of God recorded by Daniel under that mysterious uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit that we call inspiration. As evangelical Christians, a diminishing group actually, but uh, we believe that inspiration is both, we call it verbal and plenary. Verbal means is a just means that the words themselves are the words that God desired to be in the Bible. Uh, it's not just the thoughts and the concepts that are inspired, but it's the very words themselves, because thoughts are expressed by words. And we know the mind of God because he has given us his word, and so we trust in his word. Plenary just means that all of the words are inspired. So what we read are the words that God intended to be here. And as the inspired word of God, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, they are profitable. So, you understand that when this section becomes obscure and confusing, it's because we are the ones who are having the problem. We are the ones who are confused. And we are the ones who are making it uh, obscure. I think we do that sometimes when we focus on details that appear to be challenging and complicated instead of looking at what's clear and instructive. I have to tell you, I was thinking about this this morning, and I I cringe when I hear people say this. And I've heard it a lot, and you probably have too. Well, you know, what God is trying to say here, and I think, no, he doesn't try to say anything. He says what he means. If there's any hang-up, if there's any glitch, it's on our our, our part, not his. He says what he means, and he certainly means what he says. So to focus on the basic themes of this response, there are three primary features involved in this answer that Daniel received. And those are themes that we cannot comfortably cover this morning. So we'll look at them more in depth next time. But just take this away this morning. That there is great value and effectiveness in fervent prayer. Some of you have already testified to that this morning. I'm impressed with this. That Daniel Daniel knew that the calamity that he was involved in was the result of their people's own sin. And there would be an end to the captivity. And so instead of just merely waiting for the time to expire, looking at his watch and figuring out the the days, he prayed fervently, and he prayed seriously, and he prayed in a way that honored God. So he knew, he knew what the Bible said. This captivity will be over in 70 years. It's getting pretty close. It's time for me to start selling all of my stuff. Um divesting of everything here because we're going to be leaving Babylon. No. He prayed and he fasted and he confessed and his prayer was answered. The angel Gabriel himself was sent with the answer. That's extraordinary. Uh, Don't expect angelic visitations uh, as a result of your prayer. But the word came to him and yet the resolution of the matter was not immediate. He didn't say, God's heard your prayer. Guess what? Everybody's gone, just like the Exodus. We're going to leave miraculously. No, it didn't happen then. They did not immediately gain their release. Jerusalem was not immediately, nor was it easily restored. But the prayer was answered. Pray because it honors God. Pray because God responds to our prayers. 
He's not bound to respond in the way that we expect. But understand this, that his answers are always better than our requests. So pray. And pray in such a way that honors him. We'll do that right now. Father, we pray today that you would help us to be people of prayer. Help us to uh, somehow, at least uh, in a small way, to grasp the importance of this discipline and this privilege of coming before the throne of grace in prayer. Uh, we, we confess that we do this poorly. We confess that we struggle sometimes uh, to come and bow before the God of the universe. It's amazing that you would invite us to do this. And not only invite us, you would command us. And yet we don't do it well. Lord, forgive us and help us to be people of prayer for your own honor's sake and in obedience to your word. In Christ's name, amen.